dynamic decision problems. Um, this is an underappreciated um, area of uh, modeling. It's one where the techniques we've learned of great value, but really to address it well, you can, you'll benefit from bringing in a set of other techniques. So we're going to bring in decision trees here. How many people here have seen decision trees previously? Okay. Um, handful. Um, okay, so I'm going to, to motivate this with an example context because I, I think it can help um, understand help you understand some of the need for this approach if we reason through an example. So our province here has uh, suffered the higher, highest incidence of what's called West Nile virus in Canada. And it did so in two years. Does anyone know about West Nile virus? Okay, wh what do you, what have you heard about it? Good, good. Um, is it kind of transmission vector, that's right. Um, anyone else? Characteristic of Virus, what things spring to mind when you hear West Nile virus? It tends to kill, it's not really lethality, it depends on the strain, I believe. But here in Canada, yes. I believe it uh, may really affect children and people with complex diseases, but some don't. That's, uh, those are uh, high burden uh, groups. Yeah, that's, that's uh, very true. Um, it's often associated with those with weaker immune systems because they're taking immunosuppressants because they have a transplant or because they're elderly and their immune system is, is, uh, is uh, not, not as active as it once was, or, um, or because they, uh, they have uh, comorbidities like the diabetes and smoking, uh, or the smoking, they have smoking behavior, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, which weaken their immune systems, et cetera. So um, uh, these are features of West Nile, but what's very serious about it is that a certain fraction of, of cases uh, do become develop into full-blown um, uh, full blown disease, which includes neurological involvement. So what's called encephalitis and, and meningitis, so infection of the spinal cord of the brain, but, and it can even cause death, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like West Nile virus, um, I always heard the rule of thumb that you want to get West Nile virus and not be killed by it, because then you're basically immune to it from that point in time. But that, does, that seems a bit of a gung-ho approach to the disease, I guess. So Is there an So what is known is that West Nile virus exists at high levels in Africa with very, very little harm. Okay. So it's actually, um, it's, quite, it's quite a mild strain. The strain which came over to North America, it came over in about 2001, I think, through the Bronx Zoo. So they actually imported an animal from Africa. And mosquitoes were biting this animal and transmitted to birds. And this strain is much more serious. Okay. However, there is tentative evidence which suggests that perhaps children who are exposed to it uh, actually weather it better, which is interesting, and there, thereby secure lifelong immunity. So one of the um, proposals which I, I put out there, which was not widely adopted, um, was the idea of maybe there should be you know, summer camps that, that expose <laughs> to, to, uh, brilliant. So that could work. to West Nile and, and thereby really reduce the burden later <laughs> in life um, uh, through, through uh, exposing them at times where, um, uh, where you know, they're best equipped um, to handle it. Um, but, okay. but one of the, I mean, I think uh, some of us have memories from uh, summer camps that include uh, mosquitoes and um, <laughs> adverse mosquito events. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's very unclear whether that would be a uh, popular strategy among parents, to say the least. <laughs> um, and actually, the scientific evidence, I mean, putting, uh, um, joking aside, the scientific evidence is very mixed. It's a very uncertain thing what the effects are. But one thing that's quite clear, that comes through loud and clear, is that year to year, it varies hugely in terms of the burden. 2003 and 2007 were very serious years. I think 2007 it was 900 or more 
known cases of it, and probably many, many more, that were kind of milder. There were hundreds of people who were afflicted with very, very severe symptoms from it. Meanwhile, most years, like last year, virtually nothing. The year before that, virtually nothing. Some years it's really, really bad, as, as in can cause um, you know, millions and millions of dollars of, of, of harm in terms of just your medical expenses and huge loss of, of uh, quality of life. In other years, it's very mild. Um, and our, the Haskell Indian Health Region here um, actually had a reasonly high burden. It's a, it's a large health region. It's not just the Saskatoon itself, but it extends way out past Humboldt and, and way out towards the the West as well. So the basic life cycle here is of this, you have a mosquito and it bites birds and the birds develop uh, high enough levels of virus in their body called viremia that, that the mosquito, other mosquitoes that are susceptible can pick it up from them. So mos these are what's called a reservoir. So the, the virus lives in them at high enough levels it can be picked up and transmit to new mosquitoes. Meanwhile humans are what's called dead end carriers. So they can bite us, they can infect us, but if we're infected, we don't have the virus at such high levels they can get it from us. Horses are kind of in between. They, um, quite a few horses will die from the virus, um, and there's some belief that some mammals like horses may be um, at high enough levels that uh, perhaps the virus can get it from them. Although I think right now the, the balance of opinion is against that. There's some other animals like frogs that, that uh, can actually, uh, it seems, harbor at a high enough level so mosquitoes can get it. So the mosquito life cycle here is sort of, uh, is fairly evolved. You have um, uh, adults that lay eggs, and in fact, anyone know, where do they, what do they need to do to lay an egg, an adult female? That's, co water that's correct, and you need to lay them in still water sources. And the prairie landscape has plenty of these little prairie potholes with, with water sources. But what else do they need to lay eggs? They need blood. That's the reason they bite. The males don't bite you. It's the females that bite. Sometimes you see the males in these sort of uh, clouds. Like the males are, and, and I don't know why they're doing that, but they, <laughs> that's kind of the the, uh, the, the, the phenomenology of that. They kind of sit there. I think it's some sort of mating thing with the females. And they don't actually eat the blood from the baby, but the nectar of their sugary sources. They only feed their young blood? Or I, no, no, I think they actually, actually pick it up, they process it, and then they lay eggs with it. Um, oh, so it's a cow. It goes like through their gut. Oh, it does go through the gut. And they need the calcium for the eggs from the, from the blood. So they extract the calcium from the blood. So, so, so the, the mosquitoes that are biting you are biting you in part so they can lay eggs. Um, and then they have these egg rafts, and then the rafts um, develop into larvae, and then the larvae develop into pupae, and the pupae develop into adults. Now, um, what's not so clear here is there's huge, if there's huge dependence on temperature. So it turns out temperature affects many components of this cycle. So it turns out that the mosquitoes more quickly mature, so each of these stages is much quicker. Larvae, pupae to adults is much quicker. It turns out that they bite more frequently, and for a given blood meal, enough to, for them to sort of process, they actually take, um, take more bites, and they actually take more blood meals. They're, they're more metabolically active. Um, uh, my wife, who, who's a, a PhD in chemistry, tells me that as a rule of thumb, for each 10 degrees Celsius you go up, um, biological activity tends to double in speed. Um, so they're processing these things quicker, more blood meals, uh, faster maturation, and faster virus maturation. Uh, it turns out that there's also environmental dependencies on habitat, so if it's, there's more water around, it's, it's somewhat easier for them to lay eggs. Here it's not the, the constraint, it's not the real bottleneck. Um, now, uh, for humans, there's also these things that impact humans. So specifically, uh, if it's warmer, people will be outside more often, um, and uh, it makes it, if it's very warm, they're less likely to wear uh, cl clothing that, that covers them up. Um, so there's human dependencies of, on sort of uh, temperature as well. 
particularly for outdoor activity and sort of protective, uh, protective clothing. There's some other things like perceived risk and knowledge of West Nile virus that are associated with something like advisories and, and observations people can accept. So the real dilemma here, which is what I want to emphasize, is that in this case, as in quite a few other cases you'll find out there, there can be huge differences, say, year to year or you know, instance to instance in terms of outcomes. Um, and the best policy for one year, say a very hot year, may be completely wasteful for another year that's a cool year. You're not going to get very far by talking about the average year. The average year is a figment of the imagination. And what really matters is the year you've got, what should you do that? If it's a really warm year, you may undertake measures. Um, for example, uh, measures to uh, reduce uh, the amount of um, ponds available in the city, measures to, uh, to release dragonflies, which would hunt mosquitoes both in the water and in the air, measures in some cases to fog, they did this down in Esteban, they fog the air to kill the adult mosquitoes in an extreme case. But you'd be foolish to do that in a cool year. It, it doesn't make sense because there's very, very little danger. And so literally, people in the health regions across the province meet once a week through the summer to d in what are called bug busters meetings. And they basically evaluate what the situation has been. What has the temperature been like to this point? What are the mosquito counts? How many of those mosquitoes are infective? And that sort of thing. The, the challenge here, which is quite different from what we've been talking about thus far, is you know, thus far we've been talking about being able to make ju uh, decisions more judiciously based on understanding of the dynamics, based on understanding of how the system would respond to our choices, to our to to do to changing things about the system. How is it going to change its response? Here, we're going to need to make decisions, take into account uncertainty, take into account observations of things outside of our control. For example, the size of the mosquito population, its abundance how much virus is observed in it. And they actually measure these things um, by putting traps out and taking the mosquitoes and grinding them up and putting them into, into um, machines that will count, count uh, the currents of virus. Environmental conditions, how warm is it, how warm is it likely to be, and, and aspects of, of, of human behavior. Um, so I what I want to highlight for you is two very different sorts of situations you will see in modeling challenges. And I, without, without any privilege being associated with the names, I've given them the name type A and type B challenges. Um, so in type A challenges, we have complex dynamic choices that have to be made. Um, and we, we do so in a context where we, we, we know it well enough, um, we can anticipate the factors outside of our control well enough that we don't have to deal specifically with a bunch of different cases. So here we, we focus on building models to help us understand the complex impact of our choices given some expected course of events outside of our control. We don't have to worry about having totally different policies for different situations. By contrast, type B situations, we need to make complex dynamic choices where we can't anticipate the course of very important factors that are outside of our control. So what we do here, what's the optimal decision in terms of spraying you know, a larvicide or in, in terms of vaccinating the population or in terms of uh, advisories? It's going to be very different depending on whether it's a really hot year or whether it's a cool year, um, whether we've seen West Nile virus at this point or not. And here we have to focus on a dynamic model, but we need some sort of adaptive plan. I mean, planning that adapts to observations of what's going on. And this is tougher. We've got to reason about these uncertainties. But it also, ladies and gentlemen, offers opportunities because our models are incomplete. Our, early on in this class, I argued that all models are wrong, some are useful. Models are abstractions, they're simplifications, and by nature, they hide details. They, they simplify. And in many cases, we've been able to get away with those simplifications, but sometimes they hurt us. And in these cases, type B situations, we actually can observe what's going on, see if it accords with what our model anticipates, and correct accordingly. So in a way, you can actually work towards self-correcting models here. 
situations where, okay, your model may be off, but you're constantly reobserving what's going on, so you can replan accordingly. It's kind of like, I think I may have used this analogy in class one time. Each of you probably knows, you know, how to get from here to your home, either be walking or bus or driving. But if you tried to do so with your eyes closed, you'd have a tough time. You have a very good mental model, really excellent mental model, you know, very well. But if you tried to do so without constant feedback, observations, without that adaptive component, you'd have problems. You'd run into barriers. You'd climb on the wrong bus. You would walk into street signs. Um, and I could go on. So um, here, we have to observe, we make choices based on an understanding of the mosquito life cycle and the time it takes for you know, birds to get infected and stuff like that. But we also have to do adaptive planning. Planning takes into account our observations. So here, with type A problems, often what we do is um, we seek to identify, identify an optimal preset plan. You know, this is the way we should proceed. Um, this is the strategy we should use to fight gonorrhea. Um, and here, we don't have to worry too much about unfolding external conditions. They're, they're known well enough, or they're not so important uh, to, to our outcome. They don't really change our strategy. Here, however, we're talking about a totally different sort of situation. Rather than putting all our eggs in one basket for a policy, for a choice, we typically seek, seek to avoid a preset plan. Instead, we have an adaptive what we do depends on what we see happen. What we observe will shape what seems best, okay? Um, so, the question here is, how do we make decisions now? So what decision should I make now? In light of several considerations. Number one, the choice of my decision now depends so much on what is going to play out that's not under my control. What do I do now, given that I don't know whether it's going to be a hot or cold summer? What do I do come June 1st, if I'm Corey Newdorf in the Saskatoon Health Region? I've just come out of our Bug Busters meeting. What do I order? Um, I can order something now, but it might turn out favorable or unfavorable. It might be needlessly wasteful. Alternatively, it might have been just what was needed to nip it in the bud. At the same time, I want to take into account that next week I'm going to have the chance to re-examine this decision. Maybe right now I wait and see. I don't do anything, but I re-examine the situation next week. I always have that opportunity, too. I know that I'm going to be able to decide again. Okay. Um, that's attractive. Um, on the other hand, we have so many uncertainties that are going to play out. Some of those uncertainties are past us. We know how they played out. We know so far it's been a warm summer, but we're not sure what it's going to do going forward. And here we have all these temperature, precipitation, uh, prevalence of infection, and migratory bird populations, etc. Um, so, you know, should we make our, how should we make our decisions now despite these uncertainties? Should we commit to a decision now, or should we wait and see how things are trending before making decisions? You have this, this real tension. Um, you know, you have this, this tension between um, sort of, on the one hand, making a decision now may nip it in the bud. Stitch in time saves nine. On the other hand, maybe I should wait and see and kind of learn from observation so I could make better decisions. I'm going to be able to learn over the next week how the temperature is changing. So here we have these characteristics of adaptive decision problems. Here we can't come to one future trajectory for things that are outside our control. Maybe it's the economy. Maybe it's issues with you know the, the temperatures this summer. Maybe it's precipitation. Maybe it's oil prices, what have you. These things are outside our control. And when I work with clients, for example, in municipal planning, and they want to know, OK, how should they invest um, you know, in a way that, that will be robust under given uncertainties about oil prices, et cetera. Those are, are challenging problems. Um, so here we can't come to one future trajectory unfolding. We want to have the flexibility to change strategies. 
choosing a decision now requires considering the different possibilities of what might unfold in the future and the fact that we will have options of changing, of, of deciding next week, the week beyond, for example. Well, of these options of choosing things down the road. So we have to make decisions over time as we observe things unfold. And sometimes it may be advantageous to just wait and see. Kick the can down the road and let's see, let's see the issue in another week as we've seen how things play out. So here, what decision we make now depends on our current situation, what we've seen happening to this point, to be sure, the current state of the system, as perhaps would be summarized in the system dynamics model with stocks, values of stocks, for example. Um, it would depend on possible future eventualities. Okay, it's been hot so far, so maybe it's more likely it will continue hot. Um, maybe it's been a cool and dry summer, so we think it's unlikely we'll get a lot of rainfall. And we want to take into account our decision points in the future. This is not our one shot at it. We can, we can make a move now and see what happens uh, a little bit later and then either continue through it. So here we're balancing the seize the moment and wait and see type approaches. So the basic decomposition that we're going to be talking about here is between, on the one hand, um, simulation models and decision trees. Okay? So we're going to have this hybrid model that leverages the strengths of each of these things. And the two are going to work together hand in glove to, to address these challenges. The simulation model is going to do what simulation models do best, which is to understand the complex consequences associated with certain observed events and decisions. You have chosen X. You, the temperature thus far has been that. What is the consequence we're anticipating in future weeks? If we have no advisory, if we do have an advisory, how much of a difference would it make in terms of human cases? So here, simulation model is being told what it, you know, what we've observed thus far in, in the decision, and in fact, what what is going to happen down the line in terms of decisions as well as what's already happened, and say, go figure. What are the consequences in terms of things we care about? Maybe it's deaths from what's not. Maybe it's cases of severe neurological uh, cases from what's not. Maybe it's all what's not cases. Maybe it's cost. Those are all possible consequences we could examine. Taking those into account will allow a decision tree to give some advice about what decision would be best now. Okay? So I want to talk about decision trees. Some of you have encountered them before, so we will review some if not. So we're going to use decision trees uh, in this case for two things. Diagrammatically illustrating decision making in the context of uncertainty and for quali quantitative reasons. In many ways, this is kind of like the models that we looked at. Early on, we looked at uh, causal loop diagrams for qualitatively illustrating some aspects of a situation. We could reason about them to the point of reason about positive and negative feedbacks, which can give us some ideas to behavior, emergent behavior. But fundamentally, they're a qualitative thinking tool. By contrast, they also provide quantitative skills, similar with the decision tree. We can kind of diagram out a set of our choices and consequences, but we can more effectively use it for quantitative reasoning. And what decision trees are going to represent is the flow of time, the decisions over time, uncertainties that are playing out over time. So decisions over time, uncertainties over time, we don't have control over, and then finally, consequences. The consequence of a given set of decisions and events over time in terms of things we care about. Now, decision trees can be quite sophisticated, and they can be multi-attributed, for example. You have a decision to which simultaneously takes into account cost, and takes into account quality of life, and, and it turns out that modern decision tree software supports a variety of types of nodes beyond what we're going to be talking about today. But I'm focusing on the basics. Okay? Um, so there's three types of nodes we're going to talk about that are the most basic. Number one, decision node, shown as red. Uh, uh, blue square here. A decision note is associated with a set of choices. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to emphasize with this, this is very important, is that you 
have the choice as to which of these you undertake. It's a decision. It's up to you which way you decide. And what you're interested in is understanding which of them is the best, given your assumption. Hmm? Make sense? OK. Second type of node is an event node, a chance node. Here, the situation is totally different. This is a situation which is outside your control. You have a certain possibility of each choice that can happen, that can play out. And you don't have, you don't have control over which one plays out. You have to deal with the situation whichever one plays out. Corey Newdorf can decide, okay, we're going to invest in an advisory, or we're going to do larva siding, or we're going to vaccinate, not yet, but uh, probably pretty soon. Um, he, can, he can make that, that call. He can't decide whether it's going to be hot this next week, or whether it's going to be cold. Um, so chance events, we have to deal with whatever card we're dealt. Terminal nodes, by, cons by, by, uh, by contrast, summarize some consequence, some outcome, which we also don't have total control over, except in as much as our decision shaping. OK, so when we have a decision tree, we're going to put it together in a, a quite articulated um, structure here. Decision and event nodes uh, shown here, decision, event and consequences down here in the leaves. Decision trees can be quite large, as that may have suggested. Commonly, I deal with them that are thousands of, of nodes large. Um, now, once you have a decision tree, it turns out that one of the most useful features is to do what's called a rollback. How many people here have encountered dynamic programming before? Okay. A variety of algorithms? Algorithms class? Is that them? Yeah. Um, so uh, dynamic programming originated with Bellman um, and uh, was formalized uh, by him. And really what we're dealing with is a sort of dynamic programming here. It's, it's, um, it's called the rollback procedure. Um, and uh, here, it's very simple rules associated with it. Rules I anticipate you internalizing well. Um, for terminal nodes, we pack up. The, uh, we we just pass up the value. So we're we're asking, what is the rule for the value of a node? Okay, what's if we have a terminal node? What's its its value? Well, it's whatever value is assigned to it. It's a consequence that's given to it. No brainer. What sort of things can be consequences? Like in this case, it's just a cost. Uh, okay, so this might be a, a cost in millions of dollars, for example. It might be a uh, Count of West Nile uh, cases that have occurred. It might be a um, cumulative life years lived by the population. Um, uh, for for a company, it's very common for this to be profit, profit or loss. Does that make sense? That's a good question. So um, there's a whole area called multi-attributed uh, decision trees where you have multiple types in there. The simplest way to do that, um, which um, you know does a disservice to the whole literature, the uh, size of that literature, but the simplest way to do that is if you add several things that you care about, you could, if, if you're not willing to just, you know, value one of them, you could have a combination of them as, you know, some linear combination of them, A plus alpha times B plus beta times C, that sort of thing where A, B, and C are the consequences, alpha and beta are sort of relative weights, something like that. And there you'd care about some combination of, of cost and health measures. Um, alternatively, you could do things, I mean, some people do things like, um, you know, uh, say, okay, we are going to reason about dollars spent per life year saved and, and try to translate between them on the basis of that. Um, has has a bunch of perils associated with it. but. But uh, generally, you're gonna you're gonna want to have some way of reasoning about them. There are there are tools for actually reasoning about them all together. And there's there's a topic I, I don't think I'll have a chance to go into in this class um, on identifying strategies that are what are called Pareto optimal. So these are strategies which are in, it's associated with another 
concept of efficient frontier. So basically, you'd like a strategy which you'd like to be at a point where if you change any one thing, it's going to harm at least one other outcome. It's, it's optimal, not in the sense that it's perfect for any one outcome, but, but if you change any given factor, it will make it worse with at least to one of, at least with respect to one of them. And so there's a the notion of free optimality, which is just widely used in economics. Okay. Um, so here we're dealing with the values, uh, evaluating the values for nodes. For a terminal node, we are given the values. So it's, as I said, it's sort of a no-brainer. For chance and decision nodes, we have a, a more, um, you know, a, a, a different strategy. For an event node, the key point here is, for an event node, we have to deal with all possible outcomes. We have no choice. We have to deal with the card that's dealt to us by nature, as it were. So here, if we have values for each of the subnodes, we're going to take the expected value as the value of the node here. Expected value. So here, if we add, you know, possibility one, v one, uh, as the value, possibility two, v two, possibility three, v three, we would have zero point five times v one plus zero point three times v two plus zero point two times v three, and that would be expression for the value of, of this internal uh, event. We are dealing with a situation where any of these things could occur. We don't choose, we don't get to choose, and therefore we have to, we have, to have an outcome that, that depends on, on each of them. Now, there's another whole area that I'm not gonna go into which has to do with preference adjustment and reflecting the fact that losing $1,000 is a lot worse than gaining $1,000 is good sometimes. If you're really, if you're really in a bad situation, um, you know, losing a thousand dollars is, uh, in terms of badness, it's much, much worse than, than gaining a thousand dollars. You wouldn't be satisfied. Let's into operationalize. You wouldn't be satisfied to play a game where with 50% probability you win a thousand dollars and 50% probability you lose. You'd say, no way, I'm playing that game um, because. Sure, it's great if I win a thousand, but if I lose a thousand, I'm screwed. Um, and there's actually a, a whole science associated with preference elicitation and drawing out preference functions that captures this sort of situation. By contrast, you take the world's richest person. Bill Gates or Carlos Slim. He dropped the number three. There's Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim. So you take Carlos Slim. He probably will <laughs> play that game. You know, I mean. 50% either way, that's fine. And you could ask for a given person, how much? Okay, if it's not $1,000, would you be willing to pay if you have 50% chance of winning 2,000, 50% chance of losing 1,000, would you be willing to pay? And if it were 10,000, um, out of 100,000, 50% chance of losing, of, using, of winning 100,000 versus 50% chance of losing 1,000? That, that's tempting and, and through these techniques you can actually gain a sense of or, or you flip it around and you say what would the percentage winning chance of winning have to be to motivate you to do this and th would you have to be sure you're going to win with 90% probability, 1000 um, through this you can elicit preferences and there's, there's a science associated with preference elicitation which has severe shortcomings but, but is meant to try to take into account risk aversion and the fact that people, that the number itself is often impoverished and people care a lot more than just dollar figures. They, they care about something um, additional to that. But um, terminal nodes, we pass up the value. Event nodes, we take the expected value. Decision nodes, the characteristic of decision nodes, we can choose what to do. Therefore, we select whichever child offers the highest value to us. Um, the gr whichever child is best to generalize it. Um, and because we can choose which we want. And so if we are faced with a situation of having choice one, two, three, four, and we have valuations for each of those, we'll choose the one that's best for us. Does that make sense? Okay, so if this is cost, we will choose the one with the least cost, for example. If this is profit, we'll choose the one with the highest profit. 
So um, sometimes you'll see decisions um, phrased either uh, either way. Okay. Um, okay. So here's an example tree. So here we have a situation where we have some choice at week one. Okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to larvicide, adulticide, source reduce, or reduce the, the size of the pools around, or do nothing? This may seem weird, do nothing, but it's a choice often. Choice. We'll wait and see. Not so clear. It doesn't look like it's going to be that hot a week. It's been kind of mild. We have some give. We'll, we'll wait a little. We'll wait another week. We'll re-examine it another week. See how things are going. Um, now the week plays out. Maybe it's a hot week. Maybe it's a cold week. You notice these are discrete here. Well, we might have to define them as, you know, temperatures 25 and above down here, 25 and below here. Um, we're dealing with summer here. This is hot. Um, so uh, here we have, you know, another week. So week zero, week one, say. Okay, now we have to decide here. And eventually we'll get down to two consequences. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where the simulation model will come in. Because it will help us understand the consequence over time of, say, doing nothing at first, temperature is low, doing nothing again, temperature is high. What's the outcome in terms of the number of mosquitoes? That, that whole thing of mosquito dynamics or, or uh, dynamics associated with virus populations will be um, will be part of, of what we have to think through. I have some examples here using decision trees for reasoning about whether to decide or, or not, but I think with this audience, you folks are mature enough, I'm just gonna go on. We could come back to those slides if you're interested in, in, in seeing some of the reasoning with them. I wanna get to some of the, the core points of this integration. So the idea here is we're trying to arrive at a decision rule. A decision rule is going to specify for us what to do in every possible situation. We want a situation where we can give, say, the Saskatoon Health Region a map of, okay, under these conditions, you should do this. This yields the best outcomes according to things you care about. Under these conditions, do that instead. So that they can follow that script. So that they can say, okay, you know, it's been cool thus far, so we're going to do nothing. Um, you know, in these cases, we're going to, uh, we're going to undertake issuing an advisory. Right now, I, I hope I won't be uh, shocking people if I say it's, you know, there's a lot of um, guesswork and just trying to decide what to do. Th they use kind of rules of thumb, you could argue it's kind of seat of the pants. You know, um, well, it's, it's awful hot. You know, it was kind of hot like that a couple of years ago when we had that big outbreak not so far after that. You know, we're probably dealing with, and, and they'll use some data, like we're probably dealing with the fourth generation of mosquitoes now. Um, we could have another two within the next two weeks and the mosquito population could really take off. But the point is that it's unassisted. It's not, the reason about complex dynamics associated with how quickly is the mosquito population gonna multiply, how quickly does the virus spread in that population? Uh, you know, what is the, um, what is the likelihood that the uh, mosquitoes will start to be going into hibernation over the next few weeks? They're reasoning about this in their head. And a model can be really helpful, particularly in sort of reasoning about, okay, if we undertook this decision, what would be the consequences? Um, so a decision rule is what we're seeking, a sort of way of, of telling us not this policy is best, but under these conditions, this is the advice thing. So, uh, here, so we did this work, uh, we did some work in this area years back for a, a national government um, located in a different area of the world that was very interested in their infrastructure investments. Um, so they were dealing with multi-billion dollar decisions about how to expand certain aspects of their infrastructure in light of certain vulnerabilities. And uh, if I'm talking in vague tones about this, it's because I'm contractually obligated to do so. Um, uh, this was not defense related, I should note. Um, so uh, here we had decisions which had to occur. They had to decide whether to expand their infrastructure or not. And there were many types of expansion examined, many different types of ways that they could shore up their infrastructure with different technology and cost trade-offs, um, uncertainties, et cetera. And then they would see some, some impact associated with their economy 
on that infrastructure. And they could, after some observation, decide whether to expand further or whether to, to not expand, et cetera. And there'd be a set of consequences. And not having adequate infrastructure in place for the demand placed upon it by the economy could be disastrous. Having unnecessary infrastructure in place when it wasn't warranted by the state of the economy could lead them to bearing lots and lots of extra costs. So they were, they were also in this difficult situation. Not so dissimilar to what the situation is here. When Corey decides whether or not to issue advisories, it can cost a lot of money. When, when they decide whether or not to go larviciding, it can cost a lot of money and cause uh, environmental concerns. Um, if they decide to adulticide, it's an extremely serious uh, process because it involves fogging and it could potentially uh, cause harmful health effects. Um, so they're making these very weighty decisions and in light of, of uncertainties uh, of their own. So here we're going to call a scenario, a situation where we have a certain sequence of decisions and events over time. The decisions, we control. The events, we don't control. We have the sequence of decisions over time and ultimately it leads to some consequence. Some consequence, well, you didn't issue an advisory at first and the mosquito population grew hugely and then, you know, as calculated by the dynamic model, and then you, ish, you tried to do larviciding, but by that point, the first generation of mosquitoes was out and therefore wasn't you know, damaged by it in terms of its growth rate. And then, and then subsequently, you held off again and you had further growth of West Nile in the population because of high temperatures. And eventually, you get in a situation where there's perhaps hundreds of West Nile, um, West Nile cases, and many of them in the hospital. So there's two types of decision rules that I want to distinguish between. A static decision rule and an adaptive decision rule. A static decision rule is a stay the course strategy. We do the same thing regardless of condition. You say, okay, you want to do this. This is going to be our strategy. We don't need no temperature information. This, we know what we're going to do. An adaptive decision rule is going to vary its decisions what actions it undertakes based on which events have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and the observation from the decision analysis literature, static decision rules are really off. It makes sense to observe what's going on and change your decision. So here, here we have an example tree. A static decision rule, no matter what happens, you do nothing, for example. Temperature high, temperature low, do nothing. Temperature high, temperature no. Um, uh, you know, uh, well, in this case, okay, temperature is, is, has gone uh, high here, and here, always at this level, we're doing large sun. You know, week X, we're going to do this, week Y, we're going to do that, week Z, we're going to do this, um, all fixed. At a certain point in time, we have sort of fixed, uh, fixed, up. A fixed uh, decision that we're going to make. This sort of static decision rule is, is rarely, rarely optimal. An adaptive decision rule here, what we do will depend on, on the observations. For example, in this week here, week two, in some cases, if it's a low temperature, we may do nothing. If it's a high temperature, we'll do larvicide. So here, we are changing what we're going to do based on, um, based on observations. So how do, um, how to tie these things uh, together? Well, I, I was gonna talk something about decision trees, but I want to, um, I want to uh, try to try to sort of link these up, and then we may talk about that. So here we have, for example, a system dynamics model. It could be an agent-based model. Um, agent-based models have a distinction, though, because they have endogenous stochastics. So there's uncertainty resulting. And we're going to be spending a lecture talking about the implications of that, how to reason about it, how to uh, buffer against it, and, um, and develop uh, recommendations that robust that. But we have an SD model. We have a decision tree, and and then we'll, we have uh, crafted a user interface that brings them together. But um, fundamentally, we're going to have these two components, and um, we're going to link them up so the decision tree is capturing those uh, decisions and events over time, and the um, 
in the sysmodynamics model or the simulation model is calculating the consequences. Okay, so this hybrid approach is, is geared towards ongoing observation decision making. It captures uncertainty as, as time progresses, simulates a broad range of possibilities, not just a single scenario, and allows for staging of decisions over different time points, these incremental decisions. Um, and it can be used for diverse uh, planning consequences. So here, Simulation model calculates the consequence. It calculates, ladies and gentlemen, in short, the decision, or the, the terminal nodes. Um, and it takes care of deterministic simulation given events and decisions. So you tell it, okay, simulation model, these, this temperature sequence has occurred, this decision sequence has occurred, go figure about the consequences. And it says, yes, sir and goes off and calculates the costs, or goes off and calculates how many people have been hospitalized over the course of the simulation. The decision tree is representing over time possible sequence of uncertainties and events, and you know, uncertainties of decisions. It captures consequences as dictated by the decision tree, and it takes care of encapsulating all the uncertainties. The, the simulation model doesn't have to worry about the uncertainties itself. It's just told, simulate this scenario and it goes and does that. Um, okay, so the simulation model here would take care of the mosquito life cycle, which is fairly involved, mosquito multiplication, for example, different delays associated with different phases, which are germane. They're germane because if you go to larva side, it matters how many larvae they are in there and what stage they're at uh, in terms of the outcome. There's a bird life cycle associated with bird multiplication. It turns out for birds, uh, when they're really young, they're called what's fledglings, and they can't fly yet. And they are the target of predatory mosquitoes in a terrifying sort of way. So this, this baby birds get really bitten up, and it turns out that a fair number of them get infected because of it. Um, there can be transmission between mosquitoes and birds that simulated human infection disease progression, and then costs and, and resource use. Decision trees, on the other hand, are going to take into account the decision options over time, the uncertainties, the temperature here, and consequences. Okay, so here's here's an example: West Nile virus decision um, system dynamics model. This is humans, mosquitoes. There's actually a bird's bird section. And here's a decision tree, and fundamentally, the system dynamics model is going to be calculating these consequences down here. The decision tree will then do a rollback, backwards induction is another word for it. And you'll go back and you'll, using that algorithm I mentioned earlier, expected values for event nodes, choices of the best outcome, whichever outcome is best for decision nodes, it'll do a rollback from the ground up all the way to the top of the tree. And what that will give for every given decision node within the tree, it will give a recommendation as to which decision to make. sequences of event nodes in a row, you could kind of uh, collapse them by taking what might be called in physics the Cartesian product of them. So you, you, you know, let's suppose you had um, event nodes for temperature and event nodes for, um, for uh, uh, precipitation. You know, um, to, to put it most crudely, hot, hot versus cool at one level and then the next level, wet versus dry. You could turn that into one decision, or one term, one event node with four outcomes, you know, hot and, um, hot and wet, hot and dry, cool and wet, cool and dry. Um, but conceptually it'd be nicer to have them as, as two. Now we built software which links them together, it actually links Vensum on the one hand and um, decision trees as, as described by XML and, and shown visually. Um, and that software um, actually uh, audit will automatically construct you trees with certain types of structure, so you can specify them easily. And um, for simplicity, we have them with alternating decision and event nodes. 
but there's no inherent reason if you're willing to craft your own XML, um, you can you can build your own arbitrary tree. And in fact, there's quite involved decision tree software. Okay, so the result of this hybrid it involves first of all a lot of computation, one for each of these terminal nodes. What it saves is less obvious, and let's put it this way: I I might um, comment on this a little bit. Well, maybe I'll leave that for for next time as a little bit of a riddle, given the, the timing here, um, and instead concentrate on one or two other loose points. But it turns out that computing each of these terminal nodes, it, typically for a larger tree, can involve thousands of terminal nodes. That requires a fair bit of effort. But I want you to ask yourself, if you were trying to evaluate successive decision rules, successive rules like this, um, this is one decision rule, here's another decision rule. How many decision rules are there? Because if you didn't factor it into the tree on the one hand and the simulation model on the other hand, you could program this entire situation with, with uncertainties and decisions into the simulation model and then just iterate through decision rules looking for the best possible decision. And as a riddle for next time, I'm gonna ask you to think about, muse about, how many decision rules are there, each of which specifies uniquely a, a response for every decision node, a specific response to the outcome. How many decision rules are there compared to the number of terminal nodes? Which is larger? Like you know, to, to muse about that. Um, uh, because it turns out that um, that will give insight as to the attractiveness of this approach. So here we have decision trees. We do a rollback, and that gives us for each decision point a recommendation. Under that condition, in other words, you're in week three. You have seen thus far low temperatures. Um, what's what seems likely to be the best now, given the uncertainties about temperatures going forward, given the likely state of the mosquitoes in terms of their breeding population, in terms of birds, what's best uh, going forward? Um, and constantly incorporates new uh, temperatures. So if you go forward, you may give a recommendation, but then the next week you observe the temperature and you go forward from that. If we have time in this class, I'm going to be talking about a strategy called Coleman filtering, which takes this to the next level and basically allows for self-correcting models. Okay, models which observe actual measurements and correct themselves uh, over time. And this gives a little bit of a hint as to how that works. And it gets into the area of optimal control theory. Um, uh, in the meantime, I just want to make some concluding remarks about uh, decision trees and we'll sort of tie this up um, computationally um, during my next time with you. Um, when we have a decision tree, um, this is a decision tree depicted in a decision tree package. And there's many decision tree packages out there. Uh, the most popular one, which is used for this, is called Triage. Um, there's, uh, there's a variety of others, some of which work in conjunction with Excel, for example, some of which work on their own. Um, one of the interesting things that you can do with these decision trees is reason through what probabilities you have to have in place, for example, to choose one decision at a point in the tree over another. Okay. So, you know, how likely, for example, would um, would you have to have to be? How likely would uh, you know hot temperatures have to be to motivate spraying at this point? versus uh, doing larvicide, for example. In other words, spraying for, for adults versus uh, larvae. Um, how about for issuing an advisory versus larvicide? Under what conditions, um, in terms of assumptions about probabilities, uh, would one be favorable to the other? And uh, these decision tree packages allow you to, to essentially reason about the spaces under which certain decisions are more desirable than others. Um, they're really neat to use, um, and they can be good thinking tools. What they often presuppose is some ability to evaluate these scenario consequences. In other words, put a dollar figure, for example, to loss. And as we've seen, 
in many cases, evaluating these consequences requires reasoning through a quite articulated, complex situation that involves dynamics. And to do that, we use the simulation model. So um, here is a, um, a situation where we can marry, on the one hand, a very, very popular decision-making technique for reasoning about choices over time and the consequences of uncertainties and consequences um, with, uh, with simulation modeling. Okay. Um, so I'll give uh, the final twist to it next time in terms of computational load, but um, that will be um, that won't we'll be able, no won't be able to do that today. Okay. So I know at least one person here asked for a consultation with me after class about a possible project, and I'm glad to do that. If there's others as well, um, let me know now, and, and we can have a couple.